ayan. Live and direct, you're tuned into the Bro Diallo Show, broadcasting straight out of the sanctuary hypocrisy that is the city of Chirac, state of Illinois. Today is February 1st in the year of your Lord, 2020. Yes, it is the first day of White History Month. Let's all join in and celebrate. Yes, it is the first, oops, forgive me, I got a, a reset because I didn't push the uh, on-air button, damn, what, and where's the thing for the thing, hold on, um, oh, the, here we go, I'm sorry, um, I've been out a couple of days because uh, the weather, Jack Frost, came to town so I okay let me I have to redo something one more second okay just forget everything you heard in the last 15 seconds here we go again here we go live and direct oh wait wait one more time do over here we go, live and direct. You're tuned into the Bro Diallo Show, broadcasting straight out of the sanctuary hypocrisy that is the city of Chirac, state of Illinois. Today is February the 1st, in the year of your Lord, 2019. I am broadcasting on AM 1680, iTunes app, TuneIn app, and always Q4.org, Q4 Radio Chicago. Okay, now we cut. Cut. All right. I got that on. It's on the Okay, the thing is on the thing. All right. This is technical talk. Don't don't try to comprehend our level of technical um elevation here at Q4 Studios. It's Bro Diallo. Um here with you. Um sorry about Monday. Sorry about, was I here Monday? I don't know what happens one day to the next, man. Every day is a struggle, so they all blend together. I don't know what day is what day. All I know, every day is struggle day for Brother Diallo. But I wasn't here Wednesday. Well, I, I actually, I remember Monday's coming back to me now. See, this is why I don't drink or smoke or do dumb drugs, because my posse still labeled street thugs. LAPD got all my boys' mugs. Can't use my phone for the damn bugs. That's some old school iced tea. But this is why I don't smoke or drink, because I can't even imagine having my mind together. I'm, I'm, I'm perpetual so sober. Maybe I might have some refined sugars and some processed carbohydrates. You know, you know what that kind of stuff does to your system. But beyond that, I, t I tend to be sober, because I just can't imagine my brain on drugs. That frying egg on the frying pan, I, I can't, because I have, I struggle with. Even though I stay level-headed, I struggle keeping my thoughts together, so I just can't. It's not even a moral thing with me. It's, it's self-preservation. Anyway, Monday morning, I got up, got dressed, did my preparation, said my prayers, aligned my chakra, burned my sage, you know, poured libations at my ancestral shrine, everything I do every morning, and then hopped in the car and jumped on a 94 highway to make it up here to Ukrainian village. You know, which isn't too far. You know, in the, in the spring and summer, I could even ride my bike here. It's not too far from, from uh, Bronzeville. But anyway, I go through all that, and I get on the highway, and I get on at, like, exit 34, and it took me over an hour to get to exit 31, which means the highway was at a standstill. 
So it was going to take me over two hours to get here to the studio. And snow was every, they hadn't plowed. You know, we got a mayor who's basically a lame duck mayor. Uh, the the uh, IDF uh, hit, hit man, Rahm Emanuel, uh, he's decided not to run for mayor anymore. And he also had, I believe, uh, dreams of running for the U.S. Senate and eventually being the first out Jewish um, president of the United States. Because, you know, in... in, in, in um, there's a book called Empire of Their Own. It talks about Jewish history in the United States, mainly in Hollywood, and how they, you know, went to Hollywood and built their own little economic and uh, media cultural empire. But in that book, it also talks a lot about how many Jews were undercover Jews. They would change their name. If your name was Goldberg, you might change your name to Gold. You know, so they, they would pass. A lot of passing went on in the... Uh, Jewish, and they, they passed for Gentiles. A lot of Jews were passing for Gentiles back in the day. So if, if you follow the, the Alex Jonesian, Ralph Epperson, right-wing, white racist conspiracy theorists, they, they say they find a Jew in every pot, you know, everywhere they look. Somebody's a secret Jew or something. But anyway, I think Rahm Emanuel had aspirations of going to the Senate and eventually on to the White House as the first confessed, openly proud Jewish American slash Israeli citizen, Zionist. But anyway, all that's blown up for him. His political aspirations because of his participation in not just the Laquan McDonald murder and cover-up, but many other atrocious policies that he helped Obama uh, to um, push forward, and he came here to, and then Obama dumped that nightmare of a politician, Rahm Emanuel, on Chicago. We in Chicago has did nothing but love Obama for more than eight years, back when he was in the state senate, when he was a, a freshman senator, and all the time loved Obama, and Obama did nothing but defecate on Chicago, black Chicago especially. But anyway, he put that nightmare of Rahm Emanuel in office, and the city finally has awakened from the Rahm Emanuel nightmare, and we're looking forward to going into another, some other mayoral nightmare, unless, of course, y'all wake up in Chicago and vote for LaShawn K. Ford, you know, a true capable politician, not some demagogue or some, uh, some uh, hustler some fake progressive, if you vote for a true uh, uh, progressive LaShawn. But it, I doubt, I don't know, I don't have much faith in, in the Chicago electorate, but y'all might uh, surprise me. But anyway, all that to say, I, and I'm blaming Rahm Emanuel for me not getting here on Monday, because the, the, the streets weren't plowed and salted, and they tax us, man. I mean, they, they tax. And you notice, I never say taxation is theft, because I don't believe taxation is theft. I believe profit is theft. But that's a whole nother discussion, a rabbit hole I don't want to go down. But I am not anti-taxation. I am anti-misappropriation of tax. I don't mind my taxes going to public schools, public uh, libraries, uh, public roadways, um, welfare, food stamps. I don't mind my uh, tax dollars going to uh, health care and centralized public health care, Medicaid and Medicare, drug treatment. I don't want my tax dollars going to multinational corporations. I don't want my tax dollars going to fund a genocidal military and all that. So I don't, I'm not, not anti-taxation. I'm anti-misappropriation. But y'all y'all suckers and scallywops then, then got played out to become anti-taxation. When you have, actually, we have, citizens have the power to, to, to impose proper appropriations of our collective uh, income. But that's another discussion in another rabbit hole I do not wish to venture down either. I'm just saying. But anyway, Rom is kind of like, he's nobody's seen or heard from him. He, he's, he's, you know, went into his little... Uh, hell pit of uh, fire and brimstone where demonic people go to, to relax, I guess. I don't know where he is or what he's doing. I'm sure he's making deals for the future. I think Rahm Emanuel is a crook. And since, you know, America wants to pretend to hold dirty politicians accountable, you know, after, since they've been investigating 
Trump so ag in, uh, aggressively, what you're going to find is this goes and comes. So, you know, the Trump investigation, not only is Trump a crook, but the Democrats don't care about being a crook because many of them are crooks. But what is an issue is they hounded the hell out of Clinton when Clinton was in office, Bill Clinton. And they kept him under perpetual investigation. And then when Obama came, they kept him under perpetual investigation and, and false accusations. They said he was a Mau Mau. They said he was a Muslim who wanted to impose Sharia law. They said he wasn't an American citizen. So even though it wasn't an official investigation, and then they, then they got Benghazi. So they had all of those Benghazi. And then, you know, go look these things up because I don't want to rehash them. But the Benghazi scandal and then the Fast and Furious Weapons to Mexico scandal. So... It's vengeance. It's vengeance. They don't, they don't investigate and prosecute for justice. They investigate and prosecute for petty vengeance. And so that's why one of the main reasons why Obama, uh, Trump is under perpetual investigation, aside from him being a criminal, because Obama was a criminal. And my show went on the air in the second term of the Obama administration, and I spent so many times in front of this microphone not this particular microphone, because this is a newer updated microphone, but in the previous old janky microphones of Q4 Studio, um, I was ranting against the crimes of the Obama administration. And y'all didn't want to, y'all didn't hear me though. People are more receptive to hear about me rant against Trump's crimes. And I will rant against Cory Booker's crimes <laughs> or uh, Kamala Harris' crimes uh, when they get elected, which I fast and pray that they don't get elected. And I don't think they will. Obama kicked that ladder over. That ladder that Obama climbed, that, that, that newness, that new car smell of a black president, that's done. That's done. Even uh, Trump had said one thing I agree with. He said, <laughs> which is racist as hell, but, you know, just because it's racist don't mean it ain't right. <laughs> he said Obama did such a horrible job as president. Um, there'll never be another black president, you know. But we know that don't apply to white men because white men's mediocrity runs the world. You know, um, there's another good book comes to mind. Uh, Michael Moore, Stupid White Men. And I know y'all, the media told y'all, y'all don't like Michael Moore. He's a liberal, this and that. Michael Moore, actually, his books, if you, if you can tolerate it, his books are better than his movies. Surprisingly, I don't know why. Well, I do know why. Michael Moore has the money to really hire some really good researchers. So what Michael Moore does, because Michael Moore is essentially a comedian. He's not really a researcher. He's not a documentarian. He's a comedian. So what he does, though, because of the money he's made off of his movies and accolades and fame, he's able to hire real researchers and investigators. So what Michael Moore does is goes, pays these people to go out and compile this information and data. And then he just articulates it in a comedic way. It's it, you know. So anyway, and it's accurate. It's accurate information. So, you know, you can hate Michael Moore as a person, as a liberal, whatever, but you can go and dissect the, 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 the specific claims in his books, and you'll see that they, they tend to stand up to scrutiny. You know, that's why the people who hate him, like the, the right-wingers, and you left, far left, and the far right, hate, both hate him equally because he's a centrist more so, centrist liberal. Or he's a left-leaning liberal, but whatever. They talk about how fat and sloppy he is because they can't really challenge him on his facts. So they just say, oh, he doesn't love America. He's not patriotic. Or, you know, on the left, they say, oh, he's just a stinking liberal. He's not really a radical. But whatever. There's a book called Stupid White Men. And we have this illusion that white men have been so cunning to, to take over the world. They've outthought everybody. They've outworked everybody. But when you really look at it, they just smash, Hulk smash. You know, you have a nation that has a new invention. You know, the, remember, the United States wasn't ahead in technology for many years. There were many nations that were well ahead of America in computer, uh, um, thermodynamics, uh, nuclear uh, fusion or fission. Um, the space race, the communists, the stupid backwards Slavic communists made it uh, into space before the U.S. and, and rocket propelled technology in Germany, India, places of Africa, and the United States says, Hulk smash and take it. 
So anyway, uh, he wrote a good book on that. Pretty decent book on that. Where it's not brilliant. It's just kill. They didn't outthink the Black Panthers. They just killed them. They didn't outthink Marcus Garvey. They just went and put him in shackles and threw him in a dank dungeon. They literally mar locked Marcus Garvey in a dungeon. They, they tried to manipulate Martin Luther King. They, they were like, well, we got recordings of you with, with your mistress. We want you to kill yourself. We want you to, and they were like, oh, just shoot him. They just smash. You know, crack a smash. It's Captain Caveman. You ever see those Captain Caveman, chaotic, evil? But we'll talk about that, the nature of, of the true nature and, and essence of white power. You know. But I digress. I'm saying all that to say. I wasn't able to get here because the snow, the, the, which Chicago, been living here a decade now. And I, this ain't my first uh, 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 wintry northern city. You know, I was in New York during the, when they had to call in the National Guard. In the 90s, what was it, 94, for, for the nor'easter that hit uh, New York back in the early 90s? I was there, and um, it wasn't pretty. So this isn't my first, but Chicago has been real good on clearing streets, salting and clearing, shouting and shoveling. They're not good on, on, on governance. They're not good on policing the police. They're not good on education. They're not good on water filtration and, and there's lead all up in the water and throughout the soil of Chicago, a former industrial town. They're not good on quote unquote integration or racial equality. But one thing Chicago, I can't complain about in the city of Chicago is they would plow these streets and throw down that salt. I don't know what it is, it's a fluke. I guess, I mean, the Lord Jesus Christ said, you can't be bad at everything. Pick one thing, Chicago politicians. <laughs> Pick one thing that you're going to be good at. And they was like, we keep these streets clear. But anyway, this day, Monday, streets were, were deep. Like, you know, ankle deep snow on the, on, the, on the interstate highway. And it was at a shutdown. So after I was try, trudging to get here to the studio and I looked at the clock and it was after 7, I'm like, I'm going to turn back. When I'm going to get there two hours late, I'm going to get there in 15 minutes before my show has to go off the air. So I, I flipped it back. And then Wednesday, I didn't even try. I ain't going to lie. I didn't even try. The children stayed home. The wife, yeah, she teaches class on Wednesday. She didn't go. She canceled her class. Um, we all stayed in. We built a fire. And we, we just hunkered down for that day. We did not leave the house on Wednesday. And Thursday, we were back on the grind. I was a little under the weather. But I was still had to get out a little bit and do some things that I felt to do. because I. But anyway. Yeah, I'm here today. I'm here today. So let's just focus on the future forward because as in America, we are a future looking society. We don't look back. We don't think back. History, we make our own destiny. Woody, 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 woody. Okay, so can we proceed? Again, I'm sorry. Let me give a shout out to my Patreon supporters too. I just can't. I mean, I work for y'all. Y'all the boss. Y'all tell me what y'all want from me. There's a few things I want to talk about before I get to the topic of blowback, how U.S. imperialism hurts, uh, how U.S. imperialism uh, hurts uh, American citizens. And the reason I have to talk about how U.S. imperialism specifically hurts U.S. citizens is Americans don't give a flying floofy about nobody else. And I'm not just talking about white America. I'm not just talking about racist America. I'm talking about you black, you militant, you conscious, you progressive, you even so-called parent African black people don't give a damn. America is the world. America is the center of the universe. America first. MAGA. So I want to talk about that. And so maybe we can get Americans, because I oppose the U.S. empire. I do not support our troops, mainly because they're not our troops, because if it was my troops, there be a totally different manifestation. I don't support U.S. I don't root for American troops to go over and defeat enemies. I understand that these there are no foreign threats to America, that America has not constructed itself and sustained. So I am a, of a great minority. Because even, even 
You talk to these conscious folks. I was on social media for Veterans Day, and I was saying some things that could be interpreted as disparaging about the U.S. armed forces and U.S. veterans and even U.S. black veterans. And you won't believe how many Shechem's, how many Heru, Amon, El, Bays, all these conscious dudes with multi-syllabic names and RBG profile pictures all over social media. Over several social media platforms were just in my grill about talking down on the veterans. Very militaristic, militant, pro-homicidal, dearth, death urge, pro-militarist uh, culture. And it's sick. It's a byproduct. Patriot, uh, uh, patriarchy breeds uh, militarism. You know, and I call them a lot of times, I call them black Spartacans. So I want to talk about that a little bit. But before I get into that, there's some other things I want to talk about. First, I want to laugh in the face of Wisconsin's right-wing Republican uh, uh, legislature and the former governor of Wisconsin, um, Scott Walker. Now, there was a, uh, let me give you a little, just a little bit, and I'm going to try to get through this in, in three minutes. I won't give myself more than three minutes to laugh in the face of these, these stupid ass politicians. And the reason why I'm talking about Wisconsin from Chicago is because this is something I followed from the first time it was announced a couple of years ago, this uh, Foxconn deal. There's this multi-billion dollar uh, tech company called uh, Foxconn that's based out of Taiwan. And they wanted to come here to build manufacturing. And this scumbag, this criminal, Scott Walker, this hack, um, who was a Koch brothers hack, a libertarian uh, a hack, a, a Republican hack, had given this billion dollar company four billion dollars of Wisconsin cheesehead tax incentives and breaks to come and open a manufacturing plant in Wisconsin. And I'm like, well, if the Wisconsinians are dumb enough, because they tried to recall Scott Walker and then they blew up their own recall, but that's a whole, now I am not going to get into the Wisconsin recall and, 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 stri and, 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 and labor strikes. Very interesting thing, because Wisconsin has a very, very deep labor history. And I am a, a, a student of labor history and class struggle within the United States. I don't think if you don't know labor history and class struggle within the United States, you don't know anything about what makes America great. <laughs> but I digress. America is never great. But for those who have the delusion of American greatness, you don't even understand your delusion of American greatness if you don't understand labor history and class struggle. But I digress. Anyway, what they had planned to do is build this huge plant that was going to employ over 10,000 workers making flat screen LCD monitors and televisions. And that means that the waterways that we live, the Great Lakes area and the lakes and streams that flow through this region where I live were going to be highly polluted. They were going to as a, and, and because Trump's vision for making America great again is to turn America into a shithole country. Because what makes the oh, so-called, and I don't know if I'm allowed to say shit. I know they say shit on regular TV, but I'm imagining, I'll have to double check the FCC, but I think I'm allowed to say that. But I'll refrain from saying it again until I confirm that. Sometimes I go too far. But the way that Trump wanted to make America an asshole country was by, number one, doing away with environmental standards and lowering labor regulations. Because when you find every so-called third world s-hole country, those are two of the main characteristics of the s-hole countries. If you look at every so-called first world country or what's been come, evolved to call in modern days the global north, they have high environmental standards, corporate regulations, economic and finance industry regulations, and labor standards as far as incomes, benefits, vacation. Those are the two different main differences. There are some other differences, but those are key characteristics that you find in every distinguishing on that line between asshole countries and MAGA countries, great countries and asshole countries, by Trump's definition. So Trump was going to make America great by making America a third world country. 
And I'm not downing third world countries because I understand third world countries are not backwards countries. They are colonized or neo-colonized countries, which is another hole I don't want to go into. But anyway, the, a Foxconn plant was going to be one of the first major projects of this, but it was started under Obama. Trump loves this project. You know, Trump and Obama have more in common than they have against each other. They have a few things they don't get along on, but by and large, they align perfectly for many things. Because Obama went to, they went to the, uh, but anyway, I won't get into that rabbit hole. I'm trying to be disciplined this morning. So anyway, when Trump came in, he said, you know, full steam ahead on this Foxconn deal. Let's make it happen, Captain. And so they gave these Taiwanese billionaires $4 billion to create 13,000 jobs. And so far, they haven't even built the plant for them, but I think they so far, of that $4 billion, uh, Wisconsin has already made good on um, $190 million. I think, yeah, I, I looked on, I read, was reading the Chicago Tribune, some of their reporting. $190 million has already been kicked out to these billionaires who don't need the money, who could finance the plant without any input, without any tax incentives, without any, you know, they bought up land and gave them free land. Now, if I said I wanted to do something, everything I'd have to do, I have to pay the cost of everything. But anyway, not going to go down that rabbit hole. Long story short, in this most recent election cycle, Scott Walker was voted out of office and a Democrat, Tony uh, Evers, was voted into office. And Foxconn announced, uh, we're going to switch our change up. We're about to flip the script. And so Foxconn said, well, we're, we're, we're never, we're not going to build this, this massive manufacturing plant churning out American-made TVs owned by Taiwanese. I don't know, American-made. I don't know what the hell that means anymore. But they're not going to do that. So they got the money on deck. They're not going to build this giant 13,000 jobs. They're going to build what's called an R&D facility, a research and development, which will mean one, you know, that could be a few floors in an office building. No big manufacturing facilities, but a very small facility, a small laboratory. No manufacturing, no products, no outputs, just a few programmers, a few coders, a few engineers, a few tinkerers. You know, and that's it. Maybe some, some, uh, you know, some, some market research and market analysts, some statisticians, a couple of hundred jobs and a relatively small facility. And they're like, whoa. And so now the Republican legislature is saying, well, we didn't get this giant polluting factory in our state because now the Democrats tried to come back and renegotiate the deal, which made Foxconn jumpy. And, and decide to pull out, and you, you know, you're hurting Wisconsin's pros prosperity. And the Democrats are like, nah, y'all just got played. And now y'all trying to blame somebody else. If you want to blame somebody for playing you, blame Foxconn. You made a horrible deal. Now, at the most, Foxconn was promising, uh, was promised $4 billion, give or take. And for $4 billion, they were going to give working class and middle class wage jobs. So that's between $25,000 and $75,000 a year jobs. The vast majority of those jobs would have been in the lower middle range, $50,000 to, 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 to uh, $35,000 a year line worker jobs. Also, which is another part of the fine print, because Foxconn is a Taiwanese company that employs mostly Chinese workers, they would have had to bring in hundreds upon hundreds of Chinese engineers because their language and culture and operational barriers. So they would have had to bring in all of these foreign workers, the, the immigrant workers, to take care of jobs. And they said, well, this will only be for transition purposes. You know, we, we, we're a Taiwanese company with Taiwanese management, Taiwanese culture, Taiwanese, everything's written. Our manuals are all in, in Chinese or Taiwanese. So we're going to have to bring everything in and set everything up. So those 13,000 jobs, many of them were going to go to immigrant workers 
that the the uh, Foxconn brought in. But yeah, hey, you know, just till we get over some humps. And no telling how little those workers were going to get paid. Uh, engineers are a dime a dozen. I mean, the 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 country, the mainland China trains over a million engineers a year. Dime a dozen. It's not really a prestigious job. They bring them here. They put them in dormitories. Don't even allow. Them. But you know, that's another hustle. But anyway, it was it was a bad deal. It was a nightmarish deal. And did I mention the reason I got interested in this because the level of pollution. Not only did they promise Foxconn four billion dollars, they promised to say, "Hey, all environmental regulation in our waterways. You can consume as much." energy as you want, emit as much carbon and pollution as you want. We will look the other way. We're not going to do environmental impact studies. We'll keep the EPA off your back. It's all gravy. Come in here and make America shithole again. Right? And so Foxconn was like, okay, yeah. Just so some people can have some jobs, ticker jobs. Now with $4 billion for 13,000 jobs, with that money, you could get 13,000 entrepreneurs and say, hey, each of you, we'll give you $300,000 in a small business loan. And if only 1,000 of those people actually made a profitable business, you get higher tax revenues from 1,000 small businesses than you would one mega corporation that you've promised incentive to. And those thousand successful small businesses would employ more than 13,000 people. Right? So it's about entrepreneurs. So if, if, if the state of Wisconsin can give up more than $4 billion in revenues, if they spread it amongst the people, it would be better and lower carbon emission, lower footprints. You can even earmark the money to, to, to green and sustainable enterprises, eco enterprises. You know, or in 13,000 people with and spread four billion, you're spending four billion for 13,000 jobs. You can send all of those people to an Ivy League, kind, every single one of them, you can give them $300,000 for an, uh, the uh, Ivy League education and put it in the contract. If you go and get this, this uh, scholarship, you got to come back to Wisconsin and work and contribute for at least 10 years after you graduate. And you could even say, well, we want you to go into these particular arenas, healthcare. STEM jobs, liberal arts, whatever. There are so many more productive, positive, enriching ways to spend $4 billion than giving it to multi-billionaires. But that's capitalism. So anyway, it seems like the deal is just eroding, which I'm happy because my main concern, because I know those Wisconsin cheesehead, right-wing Republican idiots, Republicans shoot themselves in the foot. They vote against their own class interest. And then they turn around and want to blame immigrants and black people. They keep injuring themselves, harming themselves, and then blaming everybody except for themselves and the elites. Let me tell you, white people listening to this show, your number one threat has, is and has always been white elites. It ain't black people. It ain't immigrants, Mexicans, or no other farm or immigrants. It ain't even terrorists and ISIS and all of that. The number one threat to white people is the white elite. And their multinational corporations, their finance companies, their international bankers, the military, the white generals, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the white racist, white nationalist president, and his white elitist parasitic a uh, cabinet, the white senators, the white Republican congressmen, all of your real threats, white people, are other white people that you have put in power and that you celebrate and that you tell little white kids that they should aspire to be like. That has been the case since you got here. And every other thing that you believe is a threat has been set up, manufactured, and imposed on you by the white elites. And I'm not just talking about George Soros. Hey, you mean George Soros? No, not George Soros. <laughs> not him. If you want to look at, look at the NFL owners, the team owners, come on. And that's my one 
uh, shout out to white people, man. And there are some like there are some white people that get this. Like I said, y'all hate Michael Moore. If it's a white person that you currently hate, then more likely than not, that's a white person that's probably more beneficial for you to support. I hate them liberals. I sure hate Michael Moore. You should probably check out Michael Moore then. Because you're backwards. You are backwards. But you, I'm sure I have faith. Pray for white people. But anyway, I'm glad this Foxconn deal is eroding. I'm so happy that it's fading, and I hope it grinds to dust because that's going to give the environment a little less stress. There's going to be a little bit less mercury, cadmium, uh, dioxin, lead in our water, in our soil, in our atmosphere. And the state of Wisconsin can take that $4 billion, well, minus $190 million that they already kicked out for it, take that what's left over, and appropriate it for better to serve the citizens instead of serving multinational corporations and corrupt politicians. They're not going to do it, but they at least the, the, the theirs. Keep hope alive, as Jesse Jackson used to say. But moving on. Uh, it's just this thing. Uh, they just had the biggest uh, drug bust, it's at least for fentanyl, which is the new monster drug uh, forever in U.S. history. Um, which was captured uh, last Friday, a week ago today. You know, the, the, the uh, FBI and the uh, Drug Enforcement Agency Border Patrol had a big party, big celebration, big bonuses all around. Because, and you notice how these major drug busts always come at around the time it's time to renew the budgets and negotiate the budgets for these agencies. Don't, don't get out to tinfoil hacks. I ain't going to go too deep down this conspiracy. But just pay attention whenever they announce some major drug bust or some major military action or some major wrapping up a pedophile ring or a prostitution ring or the big bust. It's always around the budget appropriation time when it's time for the government to determine its, 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 its mandatory and discretionary budget is laid out. There's always some major media spectacle around some major police action. Now, like I said, don't put on your tinfoil hat. That's all I'm going to say about that. We ain't going to get too deep into this conspiracy today. Today? Today. But they found a truck coming through with 240 pounds of fentanyl and 339, uh, 395 pounds of meth. Now, when they found this truck was laid down, it was a cucumber truck. And some old Uncle Tom snitching dog sniffed it out. So they, they were hiding these, this meth and fentanyl under a cucumber truck. Now, this is something that speaks to Trump's border wall. Number one, you see the, the, the poundage. You know how many people it would take to carry over 500 pounds of fentanyl and meth? You think these drug cartels, these billion-dollar drug cartels, are going to just pack all that meth and all that fentanyl into the body cavities of Honduran children? and Honduran desperate mother refugees. It's just not viable. It's just not economic. So most of the drug comes through with, if you were following the El Capo trial, which I follow it, I get in and out on El Capo. But they said, we use submarines, we use drones, we use t tunnel networks, and we use commercial freight to bring our drugs in and out of America. He never said, no, none of the testimony has yet said we use desperate uh, uh, immigrants running across the desert with backpacks, with, 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 with fentanyl in their backpacks and meth stuffed, stuffed in their body cavities. It's just not viable. It's just not a sustainable way to supply America with drugs. And so they found all this meth and fentanyl in a truck, and guess what? If Trump had built his border wall and it was three times the size, it would have not had any impact on drug uh, in, in, uh, trafficking into the United States or stop terrorists. All the, the terrorists come here, they come here on student visas. But, I, but let me not perpetuate that myth about the terrorists coming here. And even the drug, the drug market, this is demand and supply. This is not supply. This, there's a high demand for drugs in America. Therefore, there will be a supply of drugs in America. And instead of working on the demand, 
through counseling, through giving, but, but uh, uh, whatever, man. I got to keep it moving. It's just long story short. Also, well, this is the kicker for, for the drugs with, with Donald Trump's built that wall. They haven't released the name or identity of the driver of that truck. And this is over a week ago. And you know how when they do a major drug bust, they pile all the drugs up on a table and then they crowd around with their, their military grade weapons and their flak vest and they've got the German shepherds sitting on each side and the, everybody's taking pictures and you got all these jack booted uh, 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 brown shirt fascist looking cops standing around with their chest pug, all these roid rage uh, 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 SWAT team people and then they have some little rinky man in a suit come up I am the chairman and, 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 and you know how they do that and then they had a perp walk they have the, the, the Mexican in handcuffs and done, throw him in a car but then they, they haven't released the identity of the dude who was driving all this fentanyl and methamphetamines into the country so that makes me think that it's a white dude. It wasn't even a Mexican. If it was a Mexican, Trump would have been wearing his face on a t-shirt for the State of the Union address. So not only is it they're not illegal immigrants bringing the drugs into our country, it's not even legal immigrants. It's not even Mexican. It's our beloved, white, hard-working, all-American, red-blooded truckers. I don't know this yet, but why are they hiding their identity? The dude is screwed. The best he could do is hope to turn over, but many of these, these drug traffickers, they don't know who, the, all they know is when the dudes show up to pack the drugs in. They, so it's not that they're holding his identity back because they can shake him down for information. If you're driving for, uh, wait, no, my math, over 600 pounds of illegal drugs into the United States, you don't know nothing about the operation or the hierarchy of the cartel. You don't know nothing. Because you're low on the totem pole. You are literally a mule. So they can't be like, well, we, we don't want to tell who he is because we have to put him. He's not going to protective custody. This is not a good fella. This is not a mob. This is a desperate truck driver who's probably addicted and smoked half the drugs on the way into the country. But they're not telling who he is. So them not telling means it's a white dude. And they don't even say who he was driving for. They're talking about he's driving. Is it a dull truck? Is it a Kraft Foods? Who is he driving the truck for? Was it a U.S. multinational corporation? So the crack pot thickens. But anyway, this just goes to show you that Trump's wall hustle is a hustle. And that's one more thing I want to say before we get to the topic. Because this is something I've been saying and I'm tired of disputing. But I guess I can't get tired of disputing until it's fully disputed. The unity delusion that black people have. I was just talking to a young lady, a positive young lady, an inspired young lady, a pro-black, Afrocentric, culturally aware, way woke, progressive young black woman who wants to make a positive attribution to the just aspirations of black people. And she was in a bit of despair because she wants to know why, what's it going to take to unify black people? Why we can't get together? When are we going to be unified? Now, my message to her is we are unified. We are together. I'm not sure why black people want to act like black folks ain't unified. We are unified people. And you go to anyway, especially in the United States, we are unified. But like the black family, where I talked about last week, a lot of times we like to act like we don't have something when we misappropriate it. We act as though it doesn't exist, thus absolve us of our mismanagement of what we have. For example, let's say I have a job and I'm making a million dollars a year. And I totally squandered that money. And then I turn around and say, I don't make enough money or I don't make any money. You would look at me and say, you're an idiot. You make a million dollars a year, which ain't a lot in some circles. I can't ball out ball so hard, but it's enough to, to, to feed, clothes, and shelter myself. More than enough, way more than anyone needs, and personally, but don't make me president, because first thing I would do is impose a maximum wage. I don't think a minimum wage means anything in a fiat currency if you don't have a maximum wage. Now, in a fixed currency, 
in a gold-based, precious metal-based currency where there is an economic ceiling, where there's a limited amount of money, resources, revenues go, then setting a, a minimum wage would automatically set a maximum wage. But because we have fiat currency, we have a debt-based currency, setting a minimum wage don't mean a damn thing. There's no checks. So you have to set a maximum wage as well. But let me stay off of that rabbit hole. All I'm saying is black people have unity. We just mismanaged the unity. We have money. We just mismanaged the money. So I'm not saying this isn't something we should be upset about, we should despair about, that we shouldn't fight about. It's just we need a proper diagnosis. Because if you think we lack something, you're going to spend all your time trying to gain what we lack. But if you realize we have something, that, and, and it's not that we lack it, it's just that we don't properly mobilize or utilize it. And it seems very minor, but it is a major major term. So black people, let's acknowledge the unity that we have. Let's acknowledge that we are together and then start to work to refine that unity. Let's start to work to properly mobilize and direct that unity. We don't lack unity. We lack the proper appropriation, the proper direction, the proper mobilization for that unity. Black people in this country, y'all all eat the same stuff. Y'all all wear the same clothes. Y'all all have the fundamental value system. Y'all all go to the same dumbass churches and pray to the same dumbass religions. There is so much unity here. There are so few divisions amongst black people. We have to make up stuff to fight about. We have to literally invent shit to fight about. Because there are just so few true or so few inherent conflicts in the hood. We all have the same discrete, uh, enemy. We have the same aspirations. We all speak the same language. We all want the same thing for our children. Hell, we damn near all look alike. Whenever you look at black people statistically, it's just all these broad 98% of black people, 98, 4, 97. We all vote for the same damn political party. Stop lying saying that black people don't have unity. We just misappropriate that unity. We use that unity to integrate with our enemy. We use that unity to prop up a party that we don't uh, hold to account. We use that unity to sustain a trillion dollar in, uh, church complex mythological Christian complex that doesn't pay back into us. We use that unity to prop up the same leaders for life that have been in the seat from Farrakhan to Messy Jesse to O'Malley, yes, to Taylor. I, I, I said that leadership for life stuff don't work, but y'all love that leadership for life. So we misappropriate unity. Stop saying we don't have unity. We have unity. We don't properly appropriate or utilize or flex our unity. We misappropriate it. We give it to the wrong people. We rally behind. You know, we prop up Beyonce's and Kanye Westesses. We use our unity in the wrong way. If you don't believe about how black people are so unified, just go to a wedding or a barbecue or go to the club this weekend and see us step all in, step in the name of love. We get behind pedophile monsters. You know, we step in the name of love. We are unified. It's low quality, backyard, chitlin bucket unity, but it is unity. So what we need to do is refine our unity, radicalize, revolutionize, pan internationalize our unity. We just need to fix it up. We got it. But what we do is we find, you know, we think, oh, somebody has a difference of opinion. Oh, there's no unity. Some street uh, thugs had a shootout in the hood. Oh, we don't have unity. We still unify. You get those kind of things with unity. You don't believe me? Look at Europeans. How many world wars have white folks fought against each other? How many civil wars? How many right now this second, how many inter, uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles does the United States have aimed at its allies in Israel, Australia, Canada, and Western Europe? They got bombs aimed at their brothers and sisters right now as they work together to screw us over. We are more unified. You can't find a more unified population than black people in the United States. So stop crying about what we got, because that makes me question you. But I digress. That's just something, that's something I, I 
Just need y'all to stop it. Chiggity, check ourselves. So I don't want to, I did a whole show, show on unity. We have unity, which is make if we were disunified, I would feel better. I would, I, I would feel much better if we were actually disunified. I would feel less despair because I'm like, hey, we're suffering, we're oppressed, we're regressing collectively, but hey, we're not unified. And I would feel much more comfortable and it's much easier to unify and oppress people than it would be to get a unified people who are already unified to, to, to have their cultural revolution, to redirect their energies and focus. That's hard as hell because we're so, we're so goddamn unified that we see Nas make a billion dollars being a venture capitalist. We see Jay-Z and Oprah Winfrey, we see black people joining our oppressors and exploiting the world's ecosystems and the world's working class people. And we celebrate that like it's a triumph for all black people. We see some colored girl, we see some four colored girl go off and be a general of the US Marine Corps and we celebrate that. We see, oh, this town has all black women judges, all black women prosecutors, all black women sheriff deputies, all black women uh, wardens of the prison. And we're like, whoop, whoop, black girl magic. <laughs> we're so unified, we celebrate other black people when they're in a position to cut our throats. You don't get more unified than that. So we don't lack unity. One more thing, let me say one more thing and then we're gonna get into the main thing. Kamala Harris. Y'all need to chill with that bed wench talk. Y'all need to chill with that she ain't black talk. But I, let me not even get into that because now I got a test for y'all. Pay attention to this black people. Just yesterday, Cory Booker, that Uncle Tom, step and fetch it, handkerchief, head, sell out. He just said, I'm going to run for president. Obama 2.0, bald head Obama. That's what I'm going to call Cory Booker from this day forward has been christened bald head Obama. Cory bald head Obama Booker just announced that he's running for president. Now I want to see, keep that same energy y'all had for Kamala Harris. Let me see if they really make the per attacks personal. And we're going to really see if sexism is just a black woman's delusion. Just a black woman uh, when just going through her monthlies, PMSing, black women just stuck up, black women just got a, got, you know, just want to tear down a black. Let's find out if sexism is real. Let's see if the people bum rush Cory Booker and viciously attack Cory Booker on everything beyond anything beyond his political record, beyond his policies. Let's see. Because I can tell you this, I can tell you in every which way how Cory Booker is as bad, if not worse, for black people in the black electorate and black politics as Kamala Harris is. I'm just curious. I'm curious. That's an old song. I'm curious. Let's see. But anyway, Cory, scumbag, uh, uh, hack for, for the Wall Street hack, Booker, bald head Obama Booker, announced yesterday that he's running. Now, let me tell you something. The problem with this, what's going on? The Democratic Party, and I, I don't want to get into this, but I have to. Forgive me, but we got a little time. We got a little time. Um, the Democratic Party had decided back in the early 90s that the major funders of the Democratic Party were labor unions and trial lawyers. And the major funders of the Republican Party were multinational corporation, investment banker, banking industry, and military contractors. And Bill Clinton and Hillary Clinton came into the Democratic Party, came out of backwoods, Arkansas, and said, listen, we can get some of that military, some of that uh, uh, investment um, sovereign wealth funds, we can get some of that Wall Street money, we can get some of that multinational corporation dollars. We don't just have to go with these, you know, labor unions. You know, we got a, a, a labor, a, we got a party that's funded by labor. They stink. Labor workers, teamsters, they stink. They're low class. And they got tired of having to go to these union halls to beg for money. Have to go to these ambulance chaser lawyers. And the reason why civil litigators 
were funding the Democratic Party is because the Democratic Party was pro-regulation. And the way that the civil litigators make their money is by suing corporations that violate regulations. So if I work for a multinational corporation and I get carpal tunnel syndrome and they find out that the, the company was violating OSHA laws that was making violating, you know, minimum work standards and safety standard laws. And then this lawyer comes in and, and it gets and finds 50 other workers. And then you get a class action lawsuit, get millions of dollars from these corporations, the cigarette companies. So the reason why the lawyers supported Democrats, not because they were pro-democracy, but, but they were pro-regulation. So, but the Democrats were like, let's get some of this Republican money. Because they got tired of having to go to these, you know, these, 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 these shysty lawyers in ill-fitting suits, these ambulance chasers. They, stopped, they got tired of having to go to these musty, dusty union halls and pretend to care about the working class people. They wanted to go like the Republicans. They were able to go to the, the Waldorf Astoria and drink high-end champagne when they went on their campaign trail. And, and Democratic uh, people had to go roll up their sleeves and put on flannel shirts and stand in the middle of farm fields or go to a truck yard. And, and look this up. I know sometimes we like to think that history is so complex. That's why they try to tell it. They don't want us to know and interpret history. So they pile all this stuff. I'm going to break it down. I'm going to tell you like it really is. I keep it real. And that's another thing, but this keeping it real stuff. I hate y'all that run around talking about Cardi B is so real. The only way for a black woman or a woman of color to be real is to be inarticulate and all that other stuff. And I'm not a moralist. Believe you me. Ain't no God I think y'all have to answer to. I want y'all to be to abandon all that fake morality. But the black women I know by and large, even in the projects, were articulate, intelligent. They had some couth. They were not materialistic, flaunt, flaunting their big diamond rings and other uh, fancy cars, get dancing on the hood of their Bentleys. So the realness of black women is the realness of dignity, resistance to oppression, of sustaining African children and Oho black families under unrelenting oppression. That's keeping it real. Stop talking about Tiffany Haddish and Cardi B being real. Those women, those sisters, whatever, I, let me let me chickity check myself, are not keeping it real. That is not real black womanhood. In fact, that is the Jezebel stereotypic coon minstrel black womanhood that was artificially manufactured by our oppressors. I said it. Now, if y'all want to cancel me or mute me, do it. Quit saying that. Now, she is, maybe she's being her sincere self, but she is not a sincere representation of realness. A shot of Shakur is real. I just hate that every time. You know, they, there was some video going around of her riding around in a car with her pants down around her knees because her pants were too tight around her silicone-infused buttocks. And that's another thing, self-acceptance. Loving, love thyself, know thyself. That's keeping it real. And she talking about screaming about yeast infection and, you know, see, sipping some, some high fructose corn syrup drink. And then I see these sisters, dignified women, educated black women talking about, oh, I love Cardi B. She's so real. And y'all didn't see in that, that whole scene, in that scene in that car, pulling her pants down. You saw her hair was done, her makeup was done. That was premeditated. She was reading off a script. I don't understand why how we get fall for the okie dog. It's like every time black people scream cultural appropriation, it's some white person acting like a degenerate. And we think they're appropriating our culture as if our culture isn't intellectual, isn't dignified, isn't intelligent, focused, and revolutionary. Pan-African. That's appropriate. No, I digress. Kamala Harris. Brothers, let me tell you something. Y'all better go as hard in on Cory Booker and his record as y'all went in on Kamala. Now we got two. And I'm, I hate to say this, but this is what y'all brought me to. I'm glad they're both fair complected. They're on the light skin side, so y'all can't even go there and claim colorism. they pretty much the same complexion. Ballhead Obama and Kamala Harris. Let's see. And let me tell y'all something. Cory Booker is the scum of the earth. But, oh, I was going to tell y'all about the, wait, let me see. I'm down too many rabbit holes. I'm finding my way back. I see the light at the end of the tunnel. And I got to get on to my topic.
But then we just do part twos and part threes, whatever. The Democrats started moving towards the right because they wanted some of that Republican money. Hey, we're getting Republican money. That's what Buster Rhyme should have, instead of that uh, uh, culturally insensitive Arab money song, he should have been getting Republican money. Bill Clinton formed the DLC. You have the DNC, the Democratic National Committee, and then you have the DLC, the Democratic Leadership Conference. And the DLC was the commission to get some of that Republican money, some of that corporate investment bank, uh, blue blood, inbred, white elite money. Right? And so they said, well, if we want to get that money, they're not like black voters. If they, if they support us, they're going to want something in return, unlike black voters. A little jab at black Democrats there. Um, so they decide, okay, we're going to put forward, we're going to deregulate uh, the, the financial services industry. We're going to, uh, oh, yeah, crime and punishment. Yeah, we're going to do the omnibus crime bill. They gave them some policies. So anyway, that's why the Republicans went crazy. The Republicans went crazy because the Democrats stole their hustle. The Democrat Tick Party in 1992 became a right-wing pro-business party. And so the Republican right-wing pro-business party was like, damn, if you come, if you sitting at my table, the Republicans had two choices, either become a left-wing pro-worker party or become a far-right-wing fascist party in order to distinguish themselves from the right-wing pro-business party. So we already know what choice they made. See how rude the cops are? Oh, that sounds more like a uh, amber lamp. Whatever. It's past now. When are we going to soundproof this studio, Q4? Anyway, I digress. But I guess I don't want to be cut off from the streets. Because <laughs> I'm from the streets. Y'all hear the streets over the air in my radio show. So, yeah, don't soundproof the radio, the, the, the studio, John. Because I keep it real. What was I talking about? Oh, and so the Republicans had a choice. Uh, go left or go further, further, further right because the Democrats went right. And they chose to go way right. So that's why, you know, if you're mad about the Republicans, I know black people ain't never messed with the Republicans since Abraham Lincoln was in office. But white folks, if you're mad about your party, this isn't your grand old party that your father voted for. Yeah, we were a little racist, but damn. Uh, blame the Democrats. Well, more specifically, blame the DLC and blame the Clintons. But anyway, so what happened was, what had happened was, all of these black Democrats would have been black Republicans if not for this political trend of what the DLC did. So these DLC Democrats like Kamala and Cory Booker, if they were active in the 80s, if they were active politically in the 80s, they would have all been Republicans. They would have been like Colin Powell, Clarence Thomas, um, Obama too. Obama's policy are Republican policies. If you look at the Democratic platform of the, under the Carter administration, when the Democrats were, had the Congress and the Democrats had control of the presidency, and did they have a, a Supreme Court majority? Yeah, I think they had a Supreme Court. The Democrats run things in the 80s and the 70s. If you look at that and you look at what the Republicans, when they were the opposition party, their platform, it's identical to the current Democratic platform, including up into, including, like I said, welfare reform, uh, deregulation, tough on crime, and, uh, and uh, well, Obama just became pro-gay marriage. They said that Biden was the one who set Obama down and pulled at Obama's heartstring because Obama was pro-family values. So Obama would have been a Republican. And if Obama hadn't pivoted to be pro-gay rights, he would have been an absolute total Republican. So that's why we get these scumbag Negro politicians. They were supposed to be Republican, like Condoleezza Rice and Colin Powell. Cory Booker should have been a Republican, but he's a right-wing Democrat, a pro-business, pro-investment uh, class, pro-venture capitalist, vulture capitalist, Democrat. So ballhead Obama is in the race. Scum of the earth. And so 
That's why you get so many scummy, 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 scummy black politicians emerging in the Democratic Party. And then a lot of true progressives, like true liberals and true progressives, because Obama's not a liberal. Cory Booker is not a liberal. Kamala Harris is not a liberal. And you look at Fox News, they all those liberals, those liberals. There are no liberals to be seen in the hierarchy or the upper echelons of the Democratic Party. Bernie's a liberal. And I'm not a fan of liberals, but I just call them as I see them. They exist. Bernie's a liberal. AOC, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, she's a liberal. But she, like they said, they, them talking about her being a majority leader in the Congress, that'll never happen. Her being a presidential candidate, not likely. And even when a liberal gets that far, like Bernie, they're going to cut him off at the knees. All that being said, yeah, Michael Steele. So we got these uh, dinos, Democrats in name only, I don't know, but these scumbag black politicians who would be much more comfortable if they were Republicans. They could talk. They, don't, they wouldn't have to give lip service. If, if, if Kamala could have ran as a uh, Republican, she wouldn't have to be doing her awkward, uncoordinated dances to Cardi B. And, you know, uh, Kamala said that her favorite artist is too short because she's out of Oakland. And, 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 and oh, I hope that comes back to bite her in her uh, flabby butt. I don't know if her butt's flabby. I've never seen it. I just wanted to say something offensive because I can't stand that woman's politics. I'm not going to apologize for it. But I hope that comes back. I hope that, now, you know, I might go find her Republican opposition and be like, she said, y'all need to be blasting too short saying this is Kamala Harris music. Don't, 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 don't fight the feeling. It's time to unwind. You was talking about you're going to give me some. Oh, that's rapping forte on a Too Short song. But anyway, I hope that comes back. She said that she loves Too Short. I hope they use that to bang on her. And then, you know, how you go be a Too Short fan and then you claim you pro-woman too, you pro-woman's rights and uh, in, in, in the year of the woman, 2.0, or hey, this is the year of the woman like 5.0. In the era of Me Too, in the era of hashtag Time's Up, how can a black woman politician be out here caping for too short? Shorty the pimp. That is just, she, she's, oh man, she's a damn fool. But I hope y'all start to sniff around Cory Booker. I really do. Because uh, he's the scum of the earth. He is the scum of the earth. And uh, like I said, um, anyway, let's talk about what we're here to talk about. Let's get into the topic at hand. No more delaying. There's so many other things I could talk about. But I'm only on the air. There's only so much time that I have on the air. Today's show is called Blowback. And what I'm talking about, what I want to talk about with Blowback is, I want to speak about how U.S. imperialism harms Americans. And I know I don't really like using the term American. But what I'm really talking about U.S. citizens. And I'm not just talking about white folks. I'm not just talking about black folks. I'm talking about everybody, every red-blooded, patriotic, taxpaying American. I'm proud to be an American, where at least I'm told I'm free. Um, the reason I want to talk about this is because the United States is gearing up to attack Venezuela. I support Maduro. I support the Bolivarian Revolution. I support Latin American sovereignty. I am against U.S. imperialism. I am against in opposition to the U.S. military and U.S. military priorities and U.S. military policies. I'm on record. Now, all that's been said, all that's been laid out. Even if you or one of these scumbag, MAGA hat, America first, America only. America is the, is, is the city on the hill, and the true bringer of democracy, and all of that nonsense. If you support our troops and you see some maimed uh, veteran high on fentanyl, 
jittering in a corner and you go up and salute him and say thank you for your service as you step over his body in a homelessness camp. Even if you're one of those people, you should oppose U.S. militarism. So I'm going to try to tell you why you should be anti. You should want, like, Trump just pulled the troops out of Syria, right? He just brought the troops out of Syria, and people are mad pissed. Even Trump didn't want to do it. Trump loves war. Trump loves war. Trump wants more war. Trump is one of the most bloodthirsty presidents. I had said Obama has so much blood on his hands that Trump is really, really going to have to work hard to surpass Obama's record of war crimes and atrocities. And believe it, I couldn't believe how fast Trump had started to accept that challenge. Trump essentially has given up his main obligation. The president is the um, commander in chief of the armed forces, which means basically Congress is supposed to have the right to declare war, but once that war is de declared, the president must oversee the war. And the chairman of the joint seats of staff answer to him, report to him, and even take instruction from him. Trump went to the Joint Chiefs, he went to the Pentagon and said, all the gloves are off. I want bodies piled up. I want blood to run. And so he has unleashed the beast. He has said, the military, don't check in with me, don't report to me, don't look for confirmation. If you think it's doable, then do it. Murder, death, kill across the board. That was Trump's military policy. Nobody even talks about it. It used to be at least Obama, who was at a real, he is a mass murderer. Obama's a serial killer. Now, from what I understand about how white folks set the law up, even if I don't get blood on my hands, even if I never touch the drugs, if I'm the man at the top giving the order, then I'm guilty of the crime. So even though Obama never strapped up and went, even though Obama wasn't using the joystick to bomb uh, children, he's just as guilty because he gave the order. That's how it works when you're part of a criminal syndicate, RICO. So yes, Obama's a serial killer. I don't know if Hitler ever killed a Jew. I don't know personally, but they hold him accountable for killing all the Jews, which I think is appropriate. If he gave the order, if he was the leader, if he was the hemorrhoid, he was at the top, then it's his responsibility. The buck stops there. And I'll, oh, you comparing Obama to Hitler? No, I'm not comparing Obama to Hitler. Because Hitler didn't know any Al Green songs. <laughs> But murder is murder. Mass murder is mass murder. You know, and I don't need to really rate mass murderers. Once you're in that box, I don't really care where you fit in the box. You in the box. But Trump, I always would say, I wanted to say, at least I had another accusation. I said to myself, Obama went on an eight-year orgy of mass murder and atrocity across the globe, violating international law. He is an international war criminal if the laws were equally enforced. If a third world dictator, if Kim Jong-un had done what Obama did, his country would have been invaded and he would be, if not assassinated, dragged off to Geneva, Switzerland to stand war crimes trial. If he had done what Obama did. If any other leader outside of the United States does what the commander in chief of the United States did, they'd be dragged off. And I said, to, I said, when all of you liberals, all of you Democrats, all of you so-called progressives, when uh, Trump gets into office and starts to commit the same atrocities that Obama committed, if y'all start to hoop and holler about Trump doing it after giving Obama an eight-year pass, and not everybody did it, Cold Pink, Medea Benjamin, there were a lot of people, uh, even Cornell West, 
Even what's that other dude? His name escapes me. There were a lot of scholars, activists calling out Obama for his atrocities. So I ain't saying everybody, but I'm like, if the shoe fits, wear it. Hit dog holla. But it don't apply to you, then I ain't talking about you. But if it do apply to you, then, you know, I'm talking about you. And I said, if, if, if you who ignored Obama's atrocities, and most of the people did, there were a few of us calling it out. And I know who was attacking me for calling it out. And then well, y'all would always say other presidents did it. But I said, when, when Trump becomes president and he continues the slaughter and y'all try to call him out and to challenge him for continuing the slaughter after ignoring the slaughter for eight years, I'm going to call you out. There's nobody to call out, though, because y'all ignoring Trump's more orgy of mass murder. Y'all are y'all pay more attention to misspelled words and tweets than y'all do the mass murdering going on right now across the globe under Trump's administration, under Trump's blessing and command. There will be more news coverage of a misspelled tweet than there are of mass murder across the globe. Why? I can't really call it. I don't know why. And I guess I could come here on the air and talk about it all day, every day. I said it this week. I said it last week, but what, what, what can I do? It really disgusts me. But again, I don't want to be just here talking to myself. So I like to give more variety. Man, if it was me, if I was self-financed, if I didn't depend on the people for support and listenership, I would come on here and talk nothing about the atrocities. I'd love to just come and read the names of all the people that are murdered by the U.S. military. Innocent. All the children in Palestine, in Djibouti, in the Congo, in Pakistan, well, northern Pakistan, in, of course, Iraq. Remember that? Hello, America, remember Iraq? Still going on. Yemen, Syria, Afghanistan, hello. That's not even counting the jackals and economic hitmen in Honduras, operating in Venezuela. And let me tell you something else. The U.S. military is not the only American military force. The IDF, the Israeli Defense Force, is a U.S. military arm. It is not an Israeli military. It is an American military that is commanded from the Pentagon, that is supplied and funded by the United States, the Colombian military, the Haitian armed forces. The Haitian armed forces. The majority of U.S. foreign aid is not vaccines. It's not bandages. It's not food. The majority of U.S. aids goes to, to weapons, to arm foreign military and police forces to suppress their own damn people. The Pakistani Defense Force and Pakistani is intelligence agencies, the Mossad, French Naval and Air Force, British Naval, those are all American militaries. They all get their marching orders from the same source. Now you got North Korea, China, Iran, Russia, axes of evil that have their own separate agenda. Not that they're just agendas, not that they're righteous agendas, they're at least independent agendas of the U.S. empire. But majority of the militaries around the world, in fact, the reason why China, Russia, North Korea, Iran, and now Venezuela have to be so militaristic is because they're literally surrounded by U.S. military and U.S. proxy militaries. But again, who cares? The Super Bowl's happening. Y'all getting ready for the Super Bowl, buying those toxic, uninspected chicken wings. Remember, they got a backlog at the FDA, so y'all, all those barbecue hot wings, better watch yourself. But y'all guts so toxic and putrid, y'all got them iron guts. You better have a vegan freaking, uh, but whatever, man. Don't have a vegan tailgate party. Nobody will come. Vegan is a lonely, lonely stance. But anyway, so let me tell you what it does for Americans. How does it hurt God's chosen people? America, what that got to do with me? 
dead niggas in Africa, dead sand niggas in the Middle East, dead Mexican, Spanish-speaking niggas in Latin South. Who cares? This is America. So how does it hurt America? How does the America's orgy of death and mass murder across the globe, what the hell it got to do with us? And them bombs over Baghdad, they're not bombs over Boston. It ain't bombs over Milwaukee. It's bombs over Baghdad. And as long as the bombs aren't dropping here, who gives a hot, dirty damn? But let me say, first of all, all of you who claim, oh, I love the soldiers. I respect our soldiers. Thank the soldiers for their service. The people who get hurt first, the people who get hurt the most by U.S. militarism are, of course, the soldiers. And I just spent, last year, I talked one. I met quite a few young people that were planning on going into the U.S. military because they didn't have any other options. And I talked one young man, I told a young man, I said, you know, Trump is the commander in chief. Young black kids on the South side, they're smart. They hate Trump. That's something. That's a sign of intelligence. So he's like, I'm not going to the military under Trump. Maybe after four years, I'll still be in my twenties. Maybe I'll see who's the next person in the coming office, but I won't serve under Trump. So I'm like, okay, I'll chalk that up as a win. But that's out of several, over a dozen young black people that I work with of the ones that I know that had planned to, to, to go to the military. So, you people, I don't thank the troops for their service. Now, if I was the CEO of a Fortune 500 company, if I was an investor, if I was a weapons manufacturer, there are some people who should be thanking the troops for their service. I'm not one of them, because I'm a working class person. So the U.S. military does not fight for me, to protect me, to shield me. If anything, the U.S. military is a grand potential threat to me and a magnificent drain on my resources, my limited resources. So I don't thank the troops for their service, but they are people. So as a soldier, I don't thank you. But as a human being, I can empathize with you. I can understand your plight and your motivations. Do I need to talk about soldier suicides? Over two dozen suicides by soldiers a day happen in this country. It goes without being reported. It goes without recognition. Also, rates of domestic violence. <laughs> the stats are mind-blowing. 91% of combat vets or PTS vets, over 91% have committed acts of domestic violence. Did you know that domestic violence was not a crime under Uniform Code of Military Justice until 2018? Let me say that again. Did you know that domestic violence was not a crime under the Uniform Code of Military Justice until 2018? And guess who made it a crime? Trump. Trump signed the, 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 the law that made domestic violence an official crime for veterans. Prior to that, there was no such crime as domestic violence in the Uniform Code. And the main reason was is because they had passed laws a, a few years ago about domestic violence. If you commit an act of domestic violence, you couldn't carry guns. So you what I mean? There, so that that explains a lot. You know, the military for years had been sacrificing the spouses of military veterans in order to keep America safe. <laughs> you know, the safety of individual women is is not as much a safety as American the empire. So, but there was this incident, this veteran named uh, Devin Kelly. He shot in 2017, he murdered uh, 26 people. He went to his wife's church and opened up with a military AR-15 and killed 26 people in the church. And he was using military equipment and military training to kill all these people, including his wife and her extended family. And then, and, but prior to that, he had a long history of domestic violence against his wife and uh, family members. And because he was still able to buy guns and do all this because he was enlisted, so they couldn't bring him up on domestic violence charges, right? And so after that, they were like, well, you know, these vets are really bugging out because 91% of combat vets, maybe, hopefully, prayerfully, uh, now that domestic violence is an official crime under the uh, UCMJ, maybe that will cause a reduction. We can get it under 90, maybe? 91% of combat vets. You know, uh, so domestic violence, suicide, drug abuse, homelessness, mental illness, 
PTSD and other forms of, of, of mental, psychological uh, uh, disruption, all are skyrocket for veterans. You take all the ills of the larger society, and when you go and apply it to just the veteran demographic, it more than doubles for most of the problems. So if you really love the troops, the first thing you would do, you would be anti-military. The worst thing for, for our troops is the military. Serving in the military, enlisting in the military, fighting for the military, being a veteran of the military. Do I even need to talk about how the veterans are getting screwed, how they're not getting adequate health care, how they have to fight and struggle for their benefits, how they're being juked on the GI Bill? So it hurts the veterans. And, it, and I know that's why they have to have those glossy ass commercials of those buff ass soldiers with clean, you know, and then they had the commercials of the veterans coming home. And the dog runs out to greet the veteran or the children run out and the children are at home and the dog is at home and the wife is at home and don't none of them know their loved one is on his way home. And then when he arrives at the door, everybody cries and then y'all go click like on social media and the videos get 50 million views and y'all just, oh, it just tears at your heart street. They never show the mangled up veteran. They never show you that the veteran that's brought home with half his face missing, breathing through a tube and pooping in a bag. And you wheel them up. Well, how the dog looks at that? Do the dog run up and lick that guy? Or does the dog run away in fear? What do the children and the wife do? Y'all some suckers, man. I'd like to see one video of a returning mangled up veteran. And then after all that, thank you for your service, all that patriotism, corporations don't like hiring vets because they're screwed up in the head. And they've got all these campaigns. The government literally has to bribe private industry to hire vets. The only places that are enthusiastic about hiring vets are the police departments. Because, I mean, it's a great, if you're a psychopath, go be a cop. They love that. It's a perfect place for you. Or be a venture capitalist. So, if you really love the veterans, you would be anti-war, anti-imperialism. I don't give a damn about vets. I love humanity. You don't have to, the people who enlist into the military don't hold any special status over the people who work at McDonald's or teach school or who break dance. I don't give a damn about your job. Your job does not define you or give you a higher standing amongst the human family. But that's my value system. I don't know about yours. That's just how I do. I love humanity. I love ecosystems and natures. So whether you're a veteran or not, I appreciate your existence. I think you are full and worthy, all of that good, wholesome stuff. That's me. And if you give a damn about humanity, you would be anti-military. If you are so sick to think that veterans are special people above and beyond every other civilian citizen, if you thought that and you were really pro veteran, you would be anti-militarism, you'd be anti-imperialism. And I don't even know why I have to explain this. And I think the worst thing you can do for veterans is venerate the veterans, to elevate the veterans. That's the worst thing you can do for them. And the veterans are like, damn, I love people giving me all this gratitude, but can you give me a job? Can you give me medicine? Can you give me health care because I've been over there breathing in depleted uranium? Gulf War Syndrome. We haven't even finished help healing the damn Vietnam War vets, the Korean War vets, the Panamanian War vets, the first and second Gulf War, the, the troops we sent over to the freaking uh, Balkan areas, the Bosnian Wars. You keep creating all these sick people with psychological and physiological problems and then underfunding and defunding their health care. But you tell me you care about veterans. Y'all don't give a damn about veterans. And this ain't no, I'm not, like I said, I'm not a patriot. I'm like the worst kind of American. I'm everything I wasn't supposed to be. I, all my teaching and indoctrination through childhood did, did everything to prevent me from becoming this person. And you all failed. I'm just saying in the interest of common decency and humanity. But let's move on beyond that. 
Some of y'all don't even care about the veterans. Some of y'all about that money. Get this money. Ain't it funny? Let's talk about the money. Let me just say, all you fiscally responsible people, all you people who are all about entrepreneurialism and opportunism, the military is the biggest drain on American prosperity. It is not welfare queens. It is not babies having babies, poor mothers on welfare. That is not the biggest drain. It is not homeless people. It is not the military is the number one drain on discretionary funds. Let me just talk about one, the war on terror, which isn't even a real war. I'm not even going to talk about World War I, the Vietnam War, the Korean. I'm not even going to. Let's just talk about it. Here's some real-time stats. Every hour, taxpayers in the United States are paying $2.28 million to care for uh, war on terror veterans since 2001. Now, remember, that's since 2001. The war in Iraq, the war on terror didn't start in 2001. The war on terror started in 1990. Remember, we went over to Iraq to save Kuwait because Kuwait was slam drilling Iraq's oil and then they gave Saddam Hussein in, in, in permission to invade. That's under the first George W. Bush. Remember the second George W. Bush said that one of the reasons he wanted to go and get Saddam Hussein is because Saddam Hussein put a hit out on his father. And the reason that Saddam Hussein put a hit out on George Bush's father is because George Bush invaded his country and slaughtered his people before his son well, he ever thought about running for president. And to this day, since just 2001, we spend $2,028,000 on the care for veterans. And even though we spend that every hour, the veterans still don't get adequate care. That's not it. This is just since 2001. Every hour, taxpayers in the United States are paying $7.99 million for a homeland security cost. And this is a brand new agency. And let's go on. Every hour, taxpayers in the United States are paying $10.5 million in interest on the war debt since 2001. Every hour, $10 million an hour. Not yearly. That's interest on the debt. War debt since 2001. But do you know that the debt, war debts from freaking World War II have not been paid off? I think we paid off World War I debt and Civil War debt. That's $10 million an hour. Every hour, taxpayers in the United States are paying $11.76 million for military costs since 2001, 11 million, really 12 million dollars an hour if you round it. An hour since 2001. Has America just started making, and that's just the most recent data. And this is cutting off. Every hour taxpayer in the United States are paying 32 million dollars in total cost of war since 2001. Over 4 trillion dollars to date since 2000 war, just on the so-called war on terror. That's not even counting the mobilization for war in Venezuela and Latin America. That's not even counting the ongoing uh, genocidal war in, in, in Palestine, in Israel, in Lebanon. That's, that's even though they try to envelope that now in the war on terror, that's been going on for 60 years. The U.S. military is the reason why your bridges don't get repaired. You drive under a bridge and you see it all rotted out. That's the reason why your children have to go into schools full of lead paint and, and mice and, and, and leaky pipes. That's the reason we have to pray that some celebrity or some ball chaser will come open a decent school for us because we as citizens don't have the ability to open a school as public citizens in the public interest. That's why the public parks have now got all corporate names. That's why they can't fill the damn potholes. That's why, right there, because the U.S. is overextended in military expenditures. That's why the corporate media that all are owned by Raytheon, Halliburton, Bechtel, uh, what's that other, Boeing right here in Illinois, Boeing Corporation, that's why those companies, they either own the media like General Electric. Well, y'all think General Electric, they just making light bulbs and refrigerators. They're one of the top military contractors in the world. And they own the media. Or if they don't own the media, they sponsor the media. 
so you don't hear about this. That's why they think you got welfare. Single mothers are the reason why you got to pay so much in taxes and fees. The reason why they can't fix stuff, why the government is broke, because of single mother, black mothers at that. You awesome suckers, man. We're moving on. If, and, and so even if you don't care about the troops, it's all about fiscal responsibility. Also, I had mentioned, alluded to this earlier, if you're a person who's fighting police brutality, where do the police get their main recruits from? The military. Where do they get their tactics from? The military. Where do they get their uh, weapons from? And vehicles from military surplus. They even take cops who never went to the military. They literally send U.S. like in Ferguson. Remember, y'all remember hands up, don't shoot. Michael Brown, the Ferguson Police Department had gone to Israel to train in crowd control tactics. Funded by the U.S. military. So the U.S. military, the same tactics that they, you know, that they use to police the streets of Baghdad, they bring them right here to the south side of Chicago. So even if you don't care about them Arabs, you don't care about them Africans, you don't care about them Mexicans, and y'all think everybody south of the border, southern Texas border, everybody south of Florida is a Mexican. Because y'all don't bother to look at the damn map. Because, hey, what does it matter? I'm an American. I'm the center of the universe. So even if you believe that, the cops kicking in your door, driving military-grade Humvees down your street, that is a byproduct of overinvestment in the military. The military gets so much funding, and then we underfund our civic life. So the, the police departments have to go bow down to the military. The, the military owns our media. They can't make a war movie. All of these movies you love, even I'm Forrest Gump. Even the movies you think wouldn't have it, they have to have sometimes intelligence agencies, CIA operatives, and or Pentagon agents that are there, quote unquote, consulting, i.e. censoring the movies. If you want to make a movie and you want to use public space, if you want to use, let's say you have a, a movie and you want to have U.S. fighter jets or a tank in your movie, then you got to go to the Pentagon to get permission to use that. And they were like, yeah, but every time, not only will we give you the tanks, we'll even give you a few dollars to help in your production. But you got to put a positive slant on the military. You got to show U.S. soldiers, instead of being rapists, instead of being cold-blooded mass murderers, you got to show U.S. soldiers being heroic and being sympathetic. I just watched this one movie, um, Bird Box. And I only the main reason I watched it is because there's just so many Bird Box memes. I don't like feeling left out. I'm a human being. I'm a social primate. So I'm like, everybody's watching Bird Box. So the other night, my wife and I, sitting in front of the fire, I decided, yo, let's watch Bird Box. And the brother, the Captain save a hole in that movie, he uh, was a veteran. And they had this veteran sitting there talking about, oh, uh, he had this one real, you know, gut-wrenching moment in the movie just before they killed him off, of course. Black men gotta die on screen through that psychological warfare. I don't know. Don't put on your tin and foil hats. I'm not going. The brother was talking about how he was in Iraq and he saw an Iraqi man walking his children down the street. <laughs> and uh, he wanted to, he's like, where are you going? They rained down on him with the military. Where are you going? He's like, I'm just walking my kids to school. And so the, the dude literally said U.S. soldiers were in Iraq walking, helping a man walk his children to school. And every day that became my duty to walk this man to school. And the man gave him a necklace when he was leaving. And then he wore that necklace because he liked to believe that this Iraqi man has been blown to bits, that he's still walking his child to school. His children had had to breathe in, walk over the corpses of their family members to go to school. And it was just so humanizing. And that just utterly disgusted me. And I know the Pentagon put that in there. Because you see that movie, they had to have a lot of logistics. You know, they had a whole a post apocalyptic movie and all that stuff. So they had some Pentagon consultants on that movie, I bet. Some intelligence agency consultants on that movie. And they were like, yeah, they probably wrote that in later. You know, let's make him an Iraq war vet. And that's why he wanted to protect this woman and protect these children. That's why he was so hopeful in humanity, because he's been to war and he understands. So he's equipped, he's armed and prepared to help our people. 
propaganda. These soldiers don't give a damn about you. And let me tell you, just like they follow orders to mass slaughter Iraqis, if they got them same orders to mass slaughter Americans who are rioting for food or rioting for justice or just marching peacefully for some other complaint about the government, they will mow us down because they've been trained to do it. And it's been done before in American history. The military is not here to protect citizens. It is here to defend the status quo. It's always been the case. You don't have one freedom from the Constitution or your personal autonomy that you owe to the government. But anyway, I digress. Just imagine if a foreign army that spoke a foreign language and worshipped a foreign god came here and blew the hell out of our country. They set up a blockade around the country and prevented any iPhones from coming in from China. They prevented any of the food, cucumbers and fentanyl from coming up from Mexico. They put an economic blockade around our country for 10 years. And then they send these bombs. And these are the kind of bombs that you don't even hear until they hit. They fly above the cloud line. You can't even hear them. And they just bomb and devastating targets. And then when they bomb our nuclear power plants and they bomb our oil processing facilities in America and all that nuclear waste and pollution falls all over the country. Nobody there to clean it up because all of our administrators, all of our bureaucrats, and then all the people with means, they got a little money, they got a little education, they saw it coming. So they all ran to Canada or ran overseas. So only the poor and working class struggling people are left here to face the bombs. And then after they do all that damn bombing, they send in the troops. And the troops march with the flag of their foreign country on their lapels. And they got all these weapons. And they don't have to obey any of the laws of this country. Whatever order they get. And we can't hold them accountable. And they're kicking in doors and turning over our houses. And we watch them kill our brothers and sisters. We watch them rape children. We watch them mutilate. They take our leaders in our community that try to stand up and advocate and they take them off to a, 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 a police station or to a prison and they take their, their testicles and crush them in vices. They torture them. They mutilate them. They rape them. They sodomize them with, 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 with the butts of guns. And then those pictures leak out onto the Internet. And then you turn, a, a few years later, you look at a movie, and in the movie, a soldier who participated in that or some character playing a soldier talks about, we went to Iraq to walk children to school. Can you imagine how freaking insulting that is? Can you imagine what that does to And that's why we got more than 24 soldiers a day blowing their own brains out, because everybody can't deal with that. Everybody can't carry that weight of what they've done. And they, they have this thing called atrocity inducing conditions. There's a book called Hitler's Willing Executioners. But there's other books that talk touch on this, like The Drowned and the Saved. That talk about you have everyday people, like your neighbor, like the people you know, you live around, the people, the person you love. You put people in certain conditions and they can start where atrocities and murder become normalized. So I didn't think this was possible, but the moral, the psychological health of this nation is being further degraded by imperialism. We have leaders, we have neighbors, we have citizens, co-citizens who have engaged in some of the most heinous atrocities in the modern era and we walk around them and they impact us. So it messes up our money. It messes up the level of, 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 of humanity, the quality of human relationships in the society. And it brings repression. It rains down repression. Everything that every nation does abroad eventually makes its way home. And now they got these programs where they want soldiers to be, encourage soldiers to be teachers. We already know that they give soldiers priority when it comes to the police academy. We know that people who have committed atrocities get elected to offices and they take that mentality into our governments, into our civic organizations. So, if one of the reasons why the United States is so backwards and so insane, and then you can't tell troops, it affects your academia. Maybe you don't care about the money. Maybe you don't care about the foreigners. Maybe you don't care about the troops. 
But when you go into school, from kindergarten up to PhD, and everywhere in between, there's only so much truth that can be told. Because the United States has to, can't just say, well, we're an empire. We're a homicidal, ecocidal, omnicidal empire. So it even affects the quality of education that your offspring will get. Even if your children will never go to the military. Even if you like Beyonce, who said, my children are going to be rich and we're going to be pimping the public for the next. And she said, my children, grandchildren, and my grandchildren's grandchildren will be paid because I got that money. I got those Bangladeshi sweatshop workers grinding for me. It affects the quality of education. It is slanted, even the liberal arts. We are taught about Americans' heroic wars, America spreading democracy. So it just makes you stupid. It lowers the overall societal IQ because there are certain thoughts that are forbidden to think in a militarist, imperialist society. And all oh, did I mention that the U.S. military is the number one polluter, the number one destroyer of ecosystems, the number one emitter of nuclear and biological waste. So even if you don't care about nothing or nobody, even if you yourself is a psychopath, if you need to breathe, if you like to drink water, if you like eating non-contaminated food, you should oppose U.S. imperialism. And not even counting. Everywhere, all over the world, there are people who would love to farm their rice, to weave their baskets, to work their jobs, and go about their existence and not think about America, but all they can think about every day is killing Americans. Because Americans have come to their land and committed grave atrocities. So even if you don't care about the quality of your water, the quality of education, the, the, the suffering of veterans, the suffering of foreigners, if all you care about is your own existence, if you're like Donald Trump, a narcissistic scumbag, you should oppose U.S. imperialism because the United States is barely 5% of the world's population. And if only the other 10% wants to cut your throat, that is a very precarious position to be in. And even now, the State Department and the Pentagon has to produce papers saying Americans should not travel to these places. And if you go to these certain places, Okinawa, the Middle East, even parts of Latin America and Africa, you better be low-key as hell because they're looking to cut American throats. And I'm sure they would prefer not to be preoccupied with cutting American throats. But if America's bombing you, it's kind of hard to focus on anything else but your oppressor. And so as the United States is preparing to topple the government of Venezuela. Oh, and another thing for you racist, if you're racist like the president. And all you care about, you just don't want to know. Not one of the main causes of mass migration, immigration, and refugees and displacement is militarism, conflicts and war, direct and indirectly caused by the U.S. military. Because if the U.S. ain't fighting the war, then the Pentagon is directing the war. If the Pentagon ain't directing the war, U.S. aid is financing the war. If the U.S. aid ain't financing the war, then it's U.S. weapons that are being sold to the people conducting the war. The U.S. has a hand in every single conflict. I don't care if it's uh, India versus Pakistan, or the drug cartels versus the, the, the narco traffickers versus the state in Colombia. Every conflict, the U.S. has a direct hand in. But that's what happens when you're the sole superpower. So even if you're just a racist saying, I don't care about none of that, I just don't want to have to be around no people who don't speak American. I don't want to be around no brown people. I think it's too many foreigners in our country. The main thing causing all the foreigners in your country is U.S. imperialism. If you would bring home... The recall the aircraft carriers, recall the submarines, recall America's troops, I guarantee you this country will be flushed of all the undesirable immigrants, non-American speaking, and by English, non-English speaking people, they will all go home. You don't believe me, just look at Haiti. When the U.S. stopped with its imperialism in Haiti, Haitians started to leave America to go back to build Haiti. And then when the U.S. Marines invaded Haiti and unseated Aristide, the, here comes the Haitians again. Hell, I even promise you, us black descendants of slaves with U.S. citizenship, if they ended U.S. imperialism, 
if they ended U.S. incursions, even some of us blue-blooded American uh, black folks, we would get the hell out of Dodge. You know, we would too. Because all we have a choice, you want to live in America under American racism or you want to live out overseas under U.S. imperialism. If there was no U.S. imperialism, we would be out of here. Just ask Marcus Garvey. Oh, we can't ask Marcus Garvey because y'all exiled him and disgraced his legacy. But I promise you. So even if you only are a white, vicious racist, you should oppose U.S. imperialism. And I guarantee you, won't nobody be up under white folks if white folks wasn't ravaging foreign lands. This is the Bro Diallo Show. Q4 Radio, AM 1680. Please become a Patreon sponsor to help keep us on the air because ain't nobody going to pay me to talk this talk. But I tell you, it's all verifiable truth. If you need to see my notes, if you want to follow me on, on, on Twitter or on all these other outlets, we can verify everything. I ain't got to talk it because I live it. But I got to talk it and live it. But did I say one more time, Q4 Radio, Q4.org, AM 1680, if you are in the city of Chirac, tune in app and iTunes Radio. Please check me. Please support. If you're not yet subscribed, please go and subscribe to my YouTube page. There's a lot of good stuff there, stuff you won't get on the air, the Q&A, the, 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 the weekly, maybe bi-monthly, I don't know. Q&A, bro, uh, Q&A sessions. But if you become a subscriber, when there's special content, you become a Patreon. There's also special access there and special opportunities. I appreciate everyone for listening. I appreciate you more if you share the program with your friends, enemies, lovers, and allies and enemies. Again, you share it with people that you know will be upset by this message, and then you can use my content as your psychological warfare. Also, that's that. But I do want to play, play, play Welling Slow's War in the East, War in the West, Rumors of War. And before I sign off, I'll see y'all Monday morning in Q4 Radio. And I have some more announcements, but I'll save it to Monday. Nothing that, that can't wait till Monday. But I, I don't want to go off the air without playing one of my favorite anti-war songs. Be anti-war. Be anti-imperialism. No matter what else your political or ideological stand is, for your basic humanity, you need to take an anti-war, anti-imperialism stance. Bro Diallo, Q4 Radio. <laughs>